All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Heritage Foundation. Um, just a quick heads up, we do have a number of seats available here <laughs> on the front row. There's seats throughout the audience, so do please come on in and sit down. Um, a couple housekeeping items to note, if everybody could take out your cell phone and double check that you were so considerate and put it on silent mode. Um, even if you're pretty sure you did, please just go ahead and double check. Um, also, at the end of this programming, we are going to have an opportunity for Q&A from the audience. We do just ask that after you raise your hand and Lila calls on you, that you wait until you have a microphone in your hand because we want those who are joining us online to be able to hear your question as well. And so with that, um, let's go ahead and kick things off. I'm Melanie Israel, a research associate here at the Heritage Foundation, and I'm so excited that we've been able to team up with Live Action for this panel today. So let me go ahead and get started and introduce you to our wonderful panelists. We've got Lila Rose, who is the president and founder of Live Action. It's a national nonprofit organization dedicated to exposing the truth about abortion and affirming the life of every child. Lila was recently featured in The Atlantic as the face of the millennial anti-abortion movement. Live Action has the largest online following in the pro-life movement, and their videos and news stories reach millions of people every week. And on the social media topic, I want to let everyone know that you can follow along through the hashtag Women's Movement Hijacked. Or did I say that wrong? Hijacked Women's Movement. That's the right, that's the right one. Hijacked Women's Movement. Um, we also have Sue Ellen Browder. She's a former writer for Cosmopolitan Magazine and author of Subverted, How I Helped <laughs> the Sexual Revolution Hijack the Women's Movement. Sue Ellen has appeared on Oprah, The Today Show, and hundreds of radio talk shows. Her work at Cosmo, New Woman, Woman's Day, and other magazines has given her a lifetime of experience in the women's movement as it unfolded in the media, both on the public stage and behind the scenes. And last, we have Dr. Helen Alvare. She's a professor of law at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. She teaches family law, law and religion, and property law. She's the founder of WomenSpeakForThemselves.com and is an ABC News consultant. She cooperates with the Permanent Observer Mission of the Holy See to the United Nations as a speaker and delegate to various United Nations conferences concerning women and the family. She publishes on matters concerning marriage, parenting, and First Amendment religion causes. And so just to kind of kick things off, Lila, I wanted to ask you um, a question before I hand it over to you. Um, as a millennial woman, you're seeing firsthand um, how the promise of the early women's movement is really conflicting with today's idea of what feminism means. So I'd like for you to explain just a little bit of what you see for this panel to be able to talk about as we dive into this further. Thank you, Melanie, and thanks a huge thanks to the Heritage Foundation for hosting us this morning, or uh, this early afternoon, and it's really awesome to see a lot of you here today, and just a lot of people that are thoughtful, passionate, working on the Hill, working throughout DC on behalf of different causes, and. It's really, really important that we have this panel today, so I'm really excited to, to be here and excited that Sue is here and Helen are here <laughs> experts on this. Um, what I just want to say briefly before introducing Sue, when I read Subverted um, two years ago now when it first came out, I was floored because I thought this is the key to unlocking the complete confusion today, to solving the complete confusion today around how women have become now, the women, women's rights, women's movement, has become synonymous with abortion and synonymous with this sexual libertinism, being sexually free, sex doesn't really have deep meaning, it's really whatever you choose to do, however, with whomever. And how did we get to this place? How do we get to this place when original feminism, the first feminists, were staunchly pro-life, staunchly pro-family, and were working tireless, tirelessly to achieve many of the rights we enjoy today as women, which are equal, we are equal in dignity to men, and we should have those equal rights. So how did it all happen? And I'm really excited that Sue will be sharing that. And the context that I approached this with at Live Action as a millennial pro-life leader, um, working in the pro-life movement, working on behalf of women, young girls, families, is the fact that we have a million abortions a year in this country. Last year, globally, there were 400 
41 million deaths because of abortion. And it's something that is touted by the Women's March. It's going to be the day after the pro-life march on Friday in DC. There's the Women's March the next day. They take the title the Women's March. And one of their the planks of their platform is abortion on demand through all nine months at any time as a sacrosanct human right. How did this happen? How did this happen when we know, many of us in this room, abortion is, the science is out. The, 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 the facts are clear. It takes a human life. It ends a human life in the womb. How did women's rights become synonymous <laughs> with taking the right of another and all the other baggage that has come alongside of it? And it's our work at Live Action to inspire and, and motivate and say, look, we can do better than this. We must do better than this as women. We should not be pitted against our children. And how did it get to the point? Because if we can know the history, then we can create and we can pave a better path for women, for children, for families into the future, yeah. where women were not victims of this this patriarchy that's always attacking us, so we need to go then take it out on our children, but where we can, we can rise above and we can do better than the women in the past, and we can do better not just for ourselves, but for our children, for children, and for families. So with that said, I'm very excited. Oh, and one other quick thing. Live Action did come out today with a special video series on this topic. Sue Ellen is featured. Um, Sue Ellen Bright is featured. Uh, please check that out at liveaction.org. And Helen, who is also just an expert on this, you're going to love hearing from her. So I'm going to start by introducing, um, having Sue come up here, a very dear friend. And I think you're really going to enjoy um, her remarks. And of course, um, based on her fantastic book, Subverted. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm very delighted to be here. I'm very humbled to be in this, in this room today. Um, I am an old Cosmo writer, and I've come to the conclusion that the pro-life women's movement is the authentic women's movement of the 21st century. And how did I come to that conclusion? Well, I wrote that book. I did some research, and, I, and that, it, it was the book that I wrote, the research that I found, that gave me that conclusion. It all started in 1971 when I was at Cosmopolitan at my little navy blue desk and I noticed something that was very obvious in those days but has now been forgotten. And that was that in those days the women's movement and the sexual revolution were two radically different movements. Betty Friedan had call, called Cosmo quite obscene and quite horrible. So how do, and Betty Friedan obviously started the feminist movement, launched the feminist movement in 1963 with the feminine mystique. So how do we get to the point where so many young women today think to be free is to go to college, get a great degree, have a fantastic job, and be as sexually free as possible? How did those two radically separate movements ever get joined together? And I started writing that book to find out. What I discovered came as a great surprise. And I hope you'll see by the end of this talk that the real cultural battle we're fighting here is not against feminism per se. We all agree women should be treated with equal dignity. We all agree women should have the right to vote and be on a jury. The real battle we're fighting is the false joining of the sexual revolution with the women's movement. What, what we're, we oppose is not defending women's dignity but reducing a woman's personhood to her sex origins and her sexual desirability and her sexual urges, and then pretending that this animalistic reduction of a woman's humanity is somehow a form of freedom. To end the culture wars between women and our nation, I think we need to separate true feminism from the sexual revolution in our minds and the minds of others. So let's start to do that by looking at the old feminism, the, fem the unifying feminist movement as it started in the 60s. Betty Friedan didn't even mention abortion and contraception in the feminine mystique. She defended the family, and she was deeply opposed to women being treated as sex objects. While Betty and other feminists were fighting in the 60s, when I was, I was there at that time, they were fighting for equal opportunities in academia and the workforce. Women were entering the workforce in droves and we were being fired for being pregnant. I was fired for being pregnant. Women in some states couldn't serve on a jury. Help wanted ads were divided in newspapers into help wanted male, all the good jobs, and help wanted female, all the uh, low paying, paying jobs. So women were very united in wanting to put a stop to all this and that's how the feminist movement became so popular. 
but it was a very unifying movement. But the sexual revolution, when I went to work at Cosmo, was an entirely different matter. Just as Hugh Hefner had reduced a woman to a sexual animal, the Playboy um, bunny, when he started Playboy, Helen Gurley Brown at Cosmo, this was the first sexual revolution magazine for women, had reduced women to a sexual animal, the Cosmo pussycat. She redesigned Cosmo as a Playboy clone and had even used Playboy's writers. So she, this, was, this was a female Playboy, still is. <laughs> Helen had a favorite slogan embroidered on a little pillow she kept on a love seat in her office, and the slogan said, good girls go to heaven, bad girls go everywhere. And at Cosmo, we turned all traditional values upside down. It was good to live with your boyfriend, good to sleep with a married man, good to take the pill, good or at least necessary to have an abortion to get ahead. And all of this in the 1970s, early 1970s, came as a shock to most Americans. A lot of single women, if a lot of women, single women were going to, met with, to bed with men on the first or second date, they surely weren't talking about it. You couldn't find these people. So that's why when I went to Cosmo, we made all those stories up about the sexual revolution. Betty, um, Helen Gurley Brown even had a uh, list of rules on how to make up stories and how to make up experts, experts who you could quote. So unlike... Uh, feminism, which was very unifying for women, the sexual revolution was a very divisive movement. You know, truth, beauty, and goodness unite. And what does evil do? It divides people. It separates us apart. So a Cosmo, we split sex from love. If sex is just for fun, if it feels good, do it. We split sex from marriage. It's okay to live with your boyfriend. We split sex from women from men. If you don't like him, just divorce him. And we split sex from babies. With the pill, take the pill, and if the pill fails, get an abortion. Betty Friedan, as I said, was so appalled by Cosmo, she called it quite obscene and quite horrible, and she urged women to boycott the magazine. So as I was, when I was at Cosmo, I was married with a child. That's, I knew the sexual revolution wasn't for me, but I thought that the women's movement was. What I didn't know was that behind the scenes, even before I arrived in New York City, abortion, contraception, and sex revolutions, false promise that splitting sex from love empowers women, had already been inserted into the women's movement due to the efforts of two men I had never even heard of. Larry Later and Dr. Bernard Nathanson, the two founders of NARAL, and now it's called NARAL Pro Choice America. Later told Nathanson that if they wanted their abortion cause to succeed, they had to recruit the feminists. And they managed to do that. Larry Later managed to convince Betty Friedan to insert abortion in the women's movement, and we know the exact moment that it happened. It was on November 18, 1967, right here in D.C., in the Chinese room of the Mayflower Hotel. And this is all in the book. If you, buy, if you read nothing in this book but chapter 5 that tells about that night and allows you to go into that room and see what happened, that will be more uh, telling than anything I can say here, actually. There were only about 100 feminists in the room that night. That was the now second annual convention, and they had all gathered to pass, the, to vote for NOW's Bill of Rights. It's their political Bill of Rights they voted for in 1967 that still guides the feminist movement to a large extent today, but it's, it has been expanded. But one vote, they, they voted on eight rights that night, and six that passed were unanimous. One was a mother's right not to be fired to be being pregnant. Another was the right of a working parents to deduct home and health care expenses on their income taxes. Another called for a woman's right to be educated to her full potential. So you see, this was all pretty reasonable stuff. We'd all agree with this. Only two rights that night um, created any uproar among these ardent feminists. One was the ERA. That's now been defeated. And the woman that walked out on the, on the ERA says, a woman's rights are indivisible. A human rights are indivisible. You can't separate them out. The other thing that created an absolute uproar that night was the abortion vote. 
Betty sprang that abortion vote on everybody at the last right, and it was it was wild. People, it was it was a microcosm of what we're still fighting today. These are feminists in that room. One said, "I'm against murder." There was a big fight that night, and when they when the dust settled, only 57 people. 57 people had voted to insert abortion into the women's movement. And one third of those ardent feminists walked out, these are founders of NOW, some of them, and resigned from NOW over the abortion vote. So at that very night, what does evil do? It splits us apart. So at that very night, we, we, the women's movement was split into two divisions. Pro-women pro feminists who were for abortion and feminists who were for life. And we're still fighting what happened in that night today in our culture. One third of those women walked out and later resigned from now over the abortion vote. And that divisive plank number eight is the only right in now's political platform that we're still fighting over today. And why? Because it was inserted largely through deception and error through under the influence of two men most of us have never even heard of. But after that, that fight in the Chinese room, Betty Friedan, who was very good at, at handling the media, she was a magazine writer like myself. Magazine writers, by the way, have pretty much wrecked the country in many ways. <laughs> but but she, she knew how to handle the media. And she stood in front of the media on Monday morning after that big fight, and she said she was speaking for, basically, here's the um, press release, 28 million American working women, the millions of women working, emerging from our colleges each year, and mothers emerging from their homes to go back to work. Basically, she claimed to be, work, to be uh, speaking for all women in America when she was speaking for only 57 people in the Chinese room. And the Washington Post, the next day, they bought it. The, there, was, there, was no, there were no reporters in the room that night. So how could they know? They bought it, and this is what the Washington Post said. Now supports the furthering of the sexual revolution of our century. Now supports the furthering of the sexual revolution of our century by pressing for widespread sex education and provision of birth control information and contraceptives, and by urging that all laws penalizing abortion be repealed. And other reporters follow the suit on that. And what, so what started out as a very unified family feminist movement for working women and mothers was subverted and became a vehicle for abortion and contraception. So what happened to those women who walked out? Where did they go, those women who resigned from now? Well, one of them was Betty Boyer. She was an attorney from Cleveland, and she went back to Ohio. States of, Ohio is always a big state, and she founded the Women's Equity Action League, W-E-A-L. I doubt that anybody's heard of it. Uh, in Cleveland, they hadn't heard of it. It, it was the pro-life family feminist movement that went forward. And what did, I, what did Wheel do? The pro-life family feminists at Wheel opened up academia to women. They forced newspapers to stop running help wanted male and help wanted female classified ads. They worked to get the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978 passed. And they worked to get women's spoke sports programs in high schools and colleges, and they lobbied for a law allowing women, a married woman to apply for credit in her own name. I'm not saying Wheel did all of these things by themselves, but now didn't even have any lawyers on staff at the time. And the, these pro-life family feminists are ones that won all, won all of these victories. By 1979, now had 100,000 members, and the National Committee for Life which represents the pro-life family feminist movement, just one part of it had 11 million members, 110 times as many. So what I'm saying here is the pro-life family feminist movement has the grassroots, it had the grassroots in 1979, and you still have the grassroots power today. And democracy doesn't grow from the, come from the top down, or at least it shouldn't. It grows from the ground up. 
And so you have the grassroots now, you continue to have the grassroots now, and I think if we proclaim that these women right here, all these women here, are the true family feminist movement of the 21st century, I think we can win this war. Thank you, my friends. Thank you so much, Sue. And we'll be able to do question and answers in a, in a moment um, to ask more questions about that. And again, a video came out today with an hour-long interview of Sue, as well as a short summary of the book and the story of how Larry Later, Bernard Nathanson, pro-abortion men convinced Betty Friedan to insert abortion in Now's platform back in that Chinese room in the Mayflower Hotel. And ever since, it's been abortion on demand in the, in the so-called women's movement. But next, I'm delighted to have Helen come up and share with her, you know, as an expert on women's issues and public policy for women, a, a, a lawyer and a scholar, um, have Helen come up and share with us her thoughts on all of this and what, what, is, what has happened to the women's movement and how we can maybe undo some of that. Thanks, Helen. Greetings, hello. Uh, so this will be quick, so you'll get to your questions. I won't be more than 10 minutes. Uh, first of all, I want to recommend Sue's book to you because it's fun. Um, you can read it at holiday time, like I did at Christmas, and it doesn't disturb your sense of fun because it's both <laughs> traumatic, what happened, and it's historic, but it's fun. She's a really excellent writer. Um, the other thing is it has the kind of power of a first-person testimony. I mean, most of you know the power of Bernard Nathanson's or, or Jane Rowe's you know, statement about what really happened, and this book has the same power. So don't forget this eyewitness power. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the book first and then a few, you know, uh, observations uh, in addition to it. Um, you know, the, the first thing I noticed about the book, uh, the, the sort of the global thing I noticed, was the huge separation between what Sue was actually experiencing with her fab husband, who, you know, was, was completely supportive of her, at times home full-time with the children, traipsing back and forth between the coast to support her career as well as his, and what she knew about men, about love, about happiness, about freedom, and about, about being a parent, versus what she was thinking she should support in her writing and in her politics. And um, I remember Pope Benedict made a comment once that the biggest problem of the 20th, 20th century, and let me tell you, at the time I thought, it's a little snotty, because what he said was, it's a lack of thinking. The human beings have stopped allowing themselves to stop and think. And finally, Sue does that after some years, and I don't mean to claim you were thinking, but, but you actually put your experience <laughs> next to uh, your, the, the, what was out there as propaganda. And I found that fascinating, and it's just something for us to tell other people to do. We know the data is going very much in the direction of what Sue, I love this expression, is calling family feminism, is support for women's freedom is support for the community that engenders that freedom. Our children's freedom is supported by the love of, of stably married folks. If we can pull that off, right? That's the best possible. Um, so, so telling people, listen, we don't mean to demean you, but if you actually stop and think, you're going to be better off on this. We have the data. She had the life experience. Um, the, the power of propaganda had to be pretty huge for someone with the, with the capacity, college degree before a lot of women were getting them, ability to write uh, in, in a marriage of intellectuals. Think about the power of propaganda to, to overcome that at the time. The second thing I love about the book is her highlighting of the clay feet of the other side, which she keeps calling, you know, the 57, right? Think about that, the, the clay feet of the other side. Um, it's often been rehearsed the birth of NOW, some women, pretty elite, <clears throat> a couple of their elite friends, a few more of their elite friends, et cetera, um, versus, of course, the power of the pro-life movement and the power of, of women when they actually gather to express their actual preferences. Um, it's just be not afraid is what I saw as the message of the, the clay feet of the other side. Um, the other thing which I think was fascinating about the book was the unveiling of sort of the roots of the obsession with sex 
the roots of the obsession with sex as the core of all freedom. Um, I wrote about this in my book um, that came out at the beginning of this year on putting children's interests first. Uh, I'm, I'm reading another book by this great um, University of San Diego scholar, Steve Smith, who, who compares uh, the, the paganism, then he talks about the Christian revolution in the fourth century, and then talks how we're basically reinstantiating a pagan view of sex now. And I think he makes a really good case. I think Sue takes it from another angle. She's showing how it started. And if you actually think about the role of Larry Later and Bernard Nathanson, and, and then the role of politics. She points out in the book the fight between Betty Friedan and some other people, and abortion being a, a, uh, <clears throat> an issue in that fight. And if Betty Friedan was going to hold on to her power at NRW, she began to think maybe she was going to have to let abortion in. You know, such small uh, political, um, not really women thinking together, grassroots up, origins of what is now this monster that has devoured authentic feminism. Um, and of course, how it was completely fed by lies. You know, the stories that she was writing, anyone who's read Bernard Nathanson's um, biography knows the lies they just sort of sat on beaches and made up to, to, to make the abortion uh, uh, changes in law happen. Um, the other thing, uh, for those who are religious or admire it, I found about the book, which is always reassuring for myself and because I'm a mother of children in this world, is God's power to reach people in the most unlikely places. And when you think about it through post-abortion syndrome, through her thinking about journalistic ethics, through her husband and her children, God was always calling her forth on this quest for meaning in a life that if you had to guess, you would say maybe there wasn't room for it. But God found you know, that crack and went in. Um, a few additional and final thoughts. One, the road not taken. So one of the things that really struck me is Sue talks about being denied um, uh, a job, a continuing job, because she was pregnant. And this comes up, I mean, I mean, I'd love to see how many times you mention it in the book, but it pops up all the time as your inspiration. I often found myself, you know, in rooms with Kate Michaelman, Faye Waddleton, uh, who was the head of NOW, Pat Ireland, et cetera. Um, and I could empathize with what got them going. And I thought about my own experiences at my law firm or at, you know, in, in, in a mostly male law school or out in the world where I was thought to be less intelligent, more emotional and, and not able to think, et cetera, uh, burdened by my pregnancies or children. And you understand why people got angry. And you understand the, uh, the agenda of, of the NOW feminist abortion aside. What if... That had been allowed, as she describes, that happened in this Ohio group to dominate, rather than allowing uh, you know, an obsession with sex, something I call in my writing sexual expressionism, to dominate. Imagine if a women's movement went forward on the good of marriage, on the good of children, on the good of sex that has any relationship whatsoever to tomorrow. <laughs> you know? Um, imagine <laughs> if if that had been part of their platform all along. Imagine where we would be. Imagine, I was thinking about this, I always think about this when I'm in Italy and I'm buying gifts for my kids. And you know, I've only got three kids, this is not huge. But in Italy they're like, oh, three children, that is so cool. You want <laughs> gifts for all of them? You know, and when I, when I was in Sicily this summer with my kids and, and, and people are like, think about a feminist movement where children were a public good versus this sort of private thing you did at home, and gee, I hope it doesn't interfere with your stuff. Just think about what that would feel like if people approached you as a parent and it was part of their valuing of you versus the, well, I see you as this separate individual in your public persona and your public job, um, and glad you're doing it in private. Hope you're doing religion in private too, by the way. Um, but imagine if it was seen as a social good. I mean, we don't want to return to the, to the days of the Old Testament where if a woman couldn't have a child, she was deemed cursed and sinful and so forth. You know, we're not there, but we want to have this seen as a public good. Imagine the difference in that mentality. Imagine where we'd be in terms of flexible work for women or in terms of pay leave, et cetera, in terms of social valuing. Valuing motherhood uh, and the time spent at home in terms of our contribution to social 
uh, social capital, social welfare, prosperity, et cetera. Imagine that. You can understand, however, how it is not entirely the fault of the pro-abortion feminists who got good and angry. I think one of Kate Michaelman's stories, I think her husband was leaving her for another woman when she was pregnant with one of their children. People pushed these women, mm -hmm. and they went in this direction to say, I've got to be like a man. I have to emerge from a sexual encounter with no possibility of a child mm -hmm. because this hurts me. You can, I, I don't blame them. It's not my place to judge them. That's for God to do. I can say they went in the wrong direction, but I don't, I don't, I, I can't, I can't always know why. But imagine if we had gone in a different way where children and mothering and priority uh, uh, for family went first. Finally, you know, uh, will we see a future swing? Because the facts are in our favor. I mean, like, that doesn't always get you somewhere. Um, you know, despite democracy dying in darkness. Uh, gee, I wish they'd look at a few of the facts, you know. Um, but it, we have the facts in our favor. The studies about women's happiness and health um, are contrary to the predictions of the sexual expressionist um, sexual revolution. Imagine if we get a swing on the Supreme Court about what substantive due process really does and does not permit. Law is not everything, but it's pretty darn important. And imagine if they say, of course it is not a fundamental part of the history and tradition of the United States to allow people to take the life of the next generation. Um, of course it's not, that's silly. The country banned it most of the time. We're still fighting over it like crazy. Every time NARAL says that it's shocking how many pro-life laws are proposed in state legislatures, you want to go, hey, NARAL, you've just made an argument against abortion being a constitutional right because it ain't part of our history and tradition. We fought then. We're still fighting. Imagine if we have a swing in the law. Imagine if the facts become more relevant to people. Imagine if just as a matter of sort of social taste, People are tired of super late marriage, um, cohabiting, um, lack of commitment, the Tinder apocalypse. Um, um, uh, if, they, if they would actually think the security of marriage and family is kind of cool. Look, wealthy women have it. Why shouldn't poor women have it too? Imagine if these things become a social force. Um, so I think things are pretty bad. Um, in this arena, not in all arenas, but in, in this arena, and I think it's to the point where the combination of truth-telling and the facts and the possible, possible, possible change in the law, maybe, um, is, is maybe going to, to, to be a force for some kind of cultural shift, I hope. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, awesome. And something I often have heard Helen say and something that Sue talks a lot about in her book, I mean, the, the premise here is this idea that women need to become like a bad acting man sexually. And, you know, the worst instinct of a man to just have <laughs> sex without responsibility, not care about any ch children that are conceived, not care about his partner, not have lifelong commitment, not, not have that responsibility. Now it's women are expected to have be the same and act the same, and that's why we need abortion. That's why we need this, this, uh, this sexual freedom that is actually not freedom. It's just a, an escape from responsibility that is that is good for us and that is actually empowering for us. Um, we're going to move to questions here, and I want to just start with one to Sue. Uh, there are a lot of writers in the room right now and thinkers, people involved in um, influencing and media, and I think that your writing is so powerful, so important, um, subverted, I think, here, subverted, everybody. Go buy one afterwards um, so you can sign it. But it, it's so powerful. What are, you, what are some of your thoughts for us, for the, the men and women in this room, about how we can use writing and, and messaging and storytelling and reporting to get this important message out there? Well, you know, Mike, Malcolm Muggeridge, who was a, a Catholic writer, he turned Catholic, he said by some strange coincidence, media people always seem to get the story wrong. <laughs> and the story that we got wrong is that there is not a war on women. There is a war between women. It's, it's family feminists on the right and pro-abortion feminists on the left. If we re take this idea and uh, and recast it. There's a whole new story here on the fact that there are pro-life family feminists out here, and they've been here forever, forever, because the old suffragists were pro-life, too. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. For questions from the audience, if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll send Allison over with a mic to ask um, a question of Sue or Helen. Um, let's see if there's a hand back there in the back. Allison? I do want to prioritize women first, <laughs> only for the point of the issue. Are there any girls that have a question for Sue or Lila or Helen? <laughs> We can start in no, the No, let's let's go with the men. The yeah. Because we need All we right, need men we need men in this uh -huh. in this battle too. We really do. Both and Okay. Well, as the first man to ask a question, <laughs> I'll just say, Brandon Show Walter Christian Post, this is a very riveting presentation. Uh, what would you say to the phrase? I mean, conservatives don't like to talk about this, but the whole concept, the feminist concept of the patriarchy. Um, would you say that it is a fair statement then in light of what happened in that room at the Mayflower that abortion is a tool of the patriarchy and how might you know conservative women pro-family women who it, it just seems like when people talk about that that concept that conservatives just kind of blow it off and yet we have seen I mean as you indicated Helen people were rightly upset about women being denied opportunities and the crimes of men leaving women when they're pregnant, the, the, the culture that has allowed this. How might you all sort of respond to that? And uh, what would you also say to those feminists who, like Gail Dines, who is terrific anti-porn feminist, there are these feminists that continue to speak out against the sexual degradation and they haven't gone all third wave pro-sex work, et cetera. Okay, well, I, I think what we want to say here is that um, the patriarchy was, yes, there was, there definitely was a patriarchy, and what you're saying is true, that the patriarchy in some ways did hijack the women's movement, and the sexual revolution, you might even say, was part of the backlash. The, the backlash against the women's movement is not the conservative backlash, the backlash was the sexual revolution. But I think this concept of the patriarchy has gone a little too far now because we've got to have men and women working in complementary together. together. Um, when that women's strike for equality in 1971, when women walked down uh, um, the streets in New York City and all over the country, one third of those people that were fighting for those women's rights were men. The National Organization for Women it's not the national organization of women. We need to reunite men and women together and realize we're all in this fight together. Sex isn't, isn't just women's rights, and it's not just men's rights. We're, we, yeah, it takes two, right? So we've got to incorporate men and stop intimidating men and say, oh, you've got to stay out of this. You can't say anything because you're a man and this is about women. No, 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 no. It's about men and women together. First, I want to thank the Christian Post, for you for your writing. Um, I think it's a little more nuanced. I think the nuance is, and not than Sue's, but then your remark, is that, it, it, mine would, would fit with Sue's, is that women shouldn't mistake the idea of abortion for a solely female thing. And they shouldn't underestimate the fact that men had a role in it, too. I, I think that it's like if you actually read the transcripts of the early uh, no-fault divorce stuff. There's plenty of, of guys making trouble there, and there's plenty of women making trouble too. So don't, I think it's more nuanced. Just don't think that men don't like what you're doing and don't think they didn't have a hand in it. And also just be intellectually honest and look at the structure you set up. Again, you set up a structure where women's bodies now structurally, uh, socially operate like men. So at the very least, the idea that this is um, a blow for women, it, it just puts in, it puts a question mark to it. I think that, of course, there's patriarchy. And of course, abortion can be a tool of it. But plenty of women, as, as, as the Old Testament in Genesis says, connived in their own subjection as well. <laughs> but the I, I would just follow up what Helen and Sue are saying in that there's bad actors on both sides. And instead of making this a discussion of these evil men are doing this to women or these women are doing this and they're bad, it's a discussion of what's right and what's wrong and whether you're a man or you're a woman taking responsibility for doing what's right. Um, sexually, when it comes to creating new life, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to honoring both your own sex and other sexes, the other sex. So I think that that's a different framework too, that 
you know, Sue and Helen are both talking about that I think is really important for conservatives, for the pro-life movement, for anyone who wants to really see everyone rising together and to see stronger families and stronger communities and better care for human rights and human dignity that has to come by seeing the equal value of every person and instead of saying this is a victim a group of victims here's a group of victims acknowledging that victimization happens but saying look how can we rise above this together how can we do better for women and men families relationships and making that the conversation both in public policy and in our personal lives and communities and that's what I'm so excited about with the pro-life movement because I think that's a lot of the conversation the pro-life movement is having. How can we make it better for women, for children, for pregnant moms, for families? And I think that's what's really winsome, winsome for, for people across the country and beyond. Um, young lady in the back. And go ahead, give your name too. Yeah. Great, so Monica Burke, I work here at the Heritage Foundation. So I was wondering if you, I would love to hear from each of you to comment on the Me Too movement and I think in many ways, this family feminism that we've talked about is the most natural response to a lot of the experiences that women have had with sexual assault. And so I'm wondering if you could elaborate upon that idea. So um, generally, I think Me Too is terrific. Um, it's about time. Um, I feel the same way about sexual abuse being uncovered anywhere, whether it's the Catholic Church or among powerful people in Hollywood or New York or anywhere else. Planned Parenthood. <laughs> Planned Parenthood, exactly. Um, so, um, of course, you know, the, the, the limits of it are, does it, you know, mimic some old feminist statement that all sex is rape, and all men are rapists. <clears throat> um, they, I think that's a problem uh, in some, that some people can carry it too far. And then the other problem, which is a little bit more subtle, is that it suggests that consent is everything. And, um, and of course, it's not um, if you actually consulted women's emotional histories and life histories, and men's emotional histories and life histories. Um, consent is not the key to freedom, happiness, a good future, uh, good parenting, um, all the things in life that come to matter to people. I, a final note, I would recommend to anybody, you know, uh, Kinsey gets all this um, uh, hype. He is a joke among the modern psychological, sociological, empirical economists. He's a joke. What's not a joke is the University of Chicago's um, survey of sexual practices in the United States in the mid-1990s, this um, sexual organization of the US or some such title, which um, enc encountered the headline of the New York Times and the Washington Post, American sexual preferences shockingly normal. And it turns out that both men and women want more than consent. They want love, they want commitment. Now, interestingly, men's version of commitment is a little bit shorter, apparently, than women, although women file for most divorces. So there's blame to go all around. Um, but uh, but it's, um, it, it just shows you that, that this idea about consent, which is their main thing, is, has got severe limitations. Also, um, Cosmopolitan actually promoted uh, sexual harassment, if you will. They asked Helen Gurley Brown what she thought, had anybody ever been sexually harassed in the office? She says, I certainly hope so. The problem is we don't have enough men to go around for harassing. Oh so that's the sexual revolution. Women were sold that bill of goods. I like to talk to this, this man here, too. <laughs> Thank you. And we have two microphones also, so we can have... Um, on this side of the room too. And just to echo what um, Helen said and, and Sue, I think that the Me Too movement is a good thing to a point. To what end? I mean, what is the end goal? And like Helen said, is it consent? Because that's not enough. And you can see even with the debate happening today, how do you even define such a thing? And then you completely strip down sex to something that's just pure biological transaction between two people. And is that really what we want sex to be anyways? So I think that we need to have this calling to account for sexual abuse, sexual harassment, objectifying practices of one sex against the other, but to what end? And that's where, again, we go back to what are we proclaiming as the end, end goal here? The end goal is unity and complementarity between the sexes and, and sex found in that lifelong commitment that can be open to life. I mean, that is where you find, I mean, Helen's research, you find the most satisfied marriages, the most satisfied and, and prospering individuals, the happiest children, and the research is on our side there. So let's, let's focus on that as the end of the positive ending to undoing or, or getting rid of all these you know, sexual objectification, abuse, harassment. 
Okay, uh, I'm Gavin. I came all the way from Austin, Texas, stayed up all night in an airport, got a taxi cab here 15 minutes away, dropped the long location, and ran all the way to the stadium <laughs> to ask a question of Lila Rose, the live action founder. <laughs> um, and I'd like to follow up with my answer to your answer, if that would be appropriate. Uh, I think you'll find it interesting. Um, what is the harm in abortion? Who does abortion harm? Uh, why? Why do we care? Who, who, who's harmed by abortion? I, I mean, I think that that's a question that, unfortunately, millions upon millions of children will never get to answer because they have never had the chance to be born. And so their voices, their stories, we've lost them today. And there's been over 60 million deaths. So there's the first harm, a life that was lost. And then as we know from the stories of brave women who've spoken out about their abortion experiences and, and men who've spoken out, it's harming to those that are survive, who are the survivors, the parents, the siblings, the cousins. I've lost, you know, we, all of us probably in this room have lost a family member, a relative to abortion. It's, it's a devastating, devastating wound in our society. And so many people can't heal because the women's movement today is touting abortion as a right as an empowering thing, as a positive thing. So, so many people don't even have an opportunity to grieve and then to heal because it wasn't really killing a life. It wasn't really a loss. There was no loss there. It was you acting out your empowerment and your rights, your reproductive freedom. And that's, I think, why there's so much anger today in our country, even the Women's March, a lot of hurt and anger beneath the surface because people aren't given the opportunity to heal or to grieve from their own loss because they're told it wasn't a loss. That's right, and I had an abortion myself, and, and I suffered from that. Abortion hurts women. We need to get that out very clearly. It also hurts men, and, and it hurts the man, but it, sometimes it festers for years and years and years and years. That abortion festered on me for 30 years before I came into the Catholic Church, was able to confess it, and was able to get forgiveness and healing. So abortion hurts women. We must say that because it yeah, obviously kills the baby, but it also, anytime you break up the connections between other people, men, women, and children, you hurt the whole country. Thank you for making it all the way out here. <laughs> and let me give you my perspective. I have over 20 years of off-table activism and uh, uh, unplanned pregnancies on the internet and following through resolutions and sometimes going off table with these individuals. And in my own circle of people that I know who are very, very uh, connected to me, there are five, count them, five suicides. Five. Exactly. And these are directly attributable to abortion. One woman who is an abortion counselor that I know uh, from where I'm at, uh, she has had three abortions and she has had three serious suicide attempts. Mm -hmm. Another person who works on uh, UK's uh, Net Moms, I believe, which is an unplanned pregnancy board, has a very close friend that very uh, strongly influences what she does. And her friend died from a suicide. Her friend is a man. Mm -hmm. And it's not an opinion. It is known that that's why he killed himself. And um, I know someone else, uh, another man, very nearly died in another suicide. And I talked to a man who is elderly just this past year during the 40 Days for Life Cycle. And I tried to get him help uh, for counselors in the area by a name basis, qualified counselors to help him. He's elderly. And he was still hurting from an abortion, was trying to get help and couldn't easily get help. And his wife pulled him away at the last second before I could give him the materials. Do you know when his abortion with his girlfriend, which is not his wife, occurred? 1973, the right. year of legalization. Right. And he still hasn't gotten help for it yet. That's right. You just can't find it. It's a public, it's a public health problem. Mm -hmm. People okay. do not understand how dangerous this is. It destroys entire lives, and some people die from it. Right. And I love your answers, mm -hmm. and I have to tell you if, you, if you deal with this, and it's real to you, and you deal with abortion victims all the time, you do not have the same opinion about abortion, especially if you know someone who's been involved in a botched surgical abortion. Thank you so very much for making it out here and for the work you're doing on behalf of those, those women and men. We have time for a couple more questions. This young woman in the front. Thank you all so much for being here. You guys are just amazing, and I love being here. Um, 
Heritage had honored me by I've been able to sit in your seat and share my story as a um, birth mom, mm -hmm. um, very pro-life and um, pro-abstinence. So I had a question for you about that. Um, what is your take on abstinence or abstinence education? And do you think that there is a space for abstinence education, what Helen called the family feminist movement and the pro-life movement? Beautiful question. Well, I think that's then you, you yes, absolutely. I think we've got the problem is we we say abstinence education that sounds like we're against sex, but no, it's against it actually um, promotes sex because good sex within a, within a marriage is very very beautiful. So so but these women are injured before they then they've had seven or eight boyfriends before they even get married. They're extremely injured. They can't form um, relationships after that because they're so hurt. So abstinence education is a positive promotion of <coughs> great sex. Great sex. I, I, I have to say, okay, I, when I was, I married my husband and I had not had any premarital sex. We had a fantastic sex life. This is the best way. <laughs> uh, I want to give a, a, a nuanced answer on this. So, <laughs> not about my sex history. I'm cool. Um, about uh, abstinence, et cetera. So, if you actually look at the data on these programs, right, we do know that what the Obama administration called the TPP, the teen pregnancy programs, did not have good outcomes. Okay. There were some very, I mean, if you look at what they were measuring in the first place, you know, even they sort of set up some of their outcomes by deciding to measure stuff that is not like crucial, right? Did you have knowledge of such and such a thing? Did you receive, you know, and oh yes, more people said they had knowledge about it. Um, then they also had questions like, did you use a condom or other birth control in first intercourse? Did you use it regularly? Did you have a pregnancy this year, et cetera? Um, they had modest to, uh, to very little outcomes or sometimes reverse outcomes on some of these things. Some abstinence programs, a few have some decent outcomes, not like huge. I'm just going to say it, right? Some. Um, and, and I just did a review, just looked at all the federal literature that I could find again just for an article that uh, I'm putting out in just a few weeks. Um, so to me, the question is not a, a lesson about sex. It's a lesson about relationships and sex being part of that. Mm -hmm. So at the end of my own book, I suggest that since people's happiness, freedom, life, their personal economies, their social interactions, everything. For most people uh, is marriage. Um, for some people is not marriage, but it's still enmeshed in a communal set of friendships or relationships with siblings, cousins, parents, et cetera, that what we really need was relationship education and family policy, not sex education and sex policy. This is like the mistake couples make when their marriage is falling apart and they go to a sex therapist. I, I've had my friends call me and I'm like, could you just shut up? No, I don't even want to hear it. That's just not going to get you where you need to get, right? You need to talk about your relationship. That's right. um, so I think that talking about, there's a book by a guy named Moran, like Sex Education in the 20th Century, where he basically says the same thing at the end. And there's been a recent study by like Barna, who does like surveys of evangelical youth. I summarized it all in, um, in this article that's coming out. I'll put it up on SSRN, uh, what's it called? Oh, Religion, Sex, and the Administrative State. So it, it looks at this. Anyway, um, young people say the sex ed or the abstinence ed is, eh. You know, it's, there's some great programs that Teen Star gets you really involved. There's some stuff that teaches girls their fertility. And all, but, but the sort of like, here's your plumbing, and now we're done, and no or yes, um, is not getting it done. And so I really think that talking about relationships, talking about marriage, talking about conducting your life in society as people will with, with relationships and sex as part of that is, is far more the answer. And all of these different sources that I cite, which are not conservative sources, tend to come to the same conclusion. The, the message of the sexual revolution was that sex is just an act and it's not about relationship. It was divorcing sex not only from children but from relationship, um, from marriage, from lifelong commitments and bonds. 
And that is why today, even our public policy is mirroring this ideology that is outdated. The science doesn't back it. It doesn't lead to, hum lead to human flourishing. And today we have these policies that are just, again, treating sex as not relationship, but it's about this sexual act and you put some plastic on it to prevent pregnancy or to prevent certain STIs and then you just learn the plumbing, as Helen says, and you're off to go to the races. It's not working. It's not working. And even, you know, the Atlantic recently reported actually some millennials are having less sex. Well, they're actually not having less sex. They're having sex with themselves now because the relationship part, the, you know, the masturbation and pornography, the relationship part has so deteriorated. And now in the era of Me Too, you don't even, you're, you're afraid of sex, you know, with another person because you might, it might be assault or it might be harassment or who knows what it is. Um, and now where, where do we leave? We're almost sexless or just sex, sex with ourselves. I mean, it's, it's the complete deterioration of relationships. And people aren't happy with that because that's not what we're made for. We're made for relationship. We're made for love. We're made for commitment. We're made for responsibility. These are good, good things. The research backs that. And I'm really excited about the potential of our movements to, to s send this message and to build these, these pro-relationship, pro-love, pro-family programs on the public policy side, but then in our communities through faith-based groups, through nonprofits, to really encourage these things. Because I think this is where we're really going to find a, a, a country of people that are flourishing and not harming themselves and others. I think we have time for maybe one, maybe two more questions. I'll take this young lady in the front. Thank you so much all for coming here today. My name is Natalie and I'm president of Students for Life at the George Washington University. I had a question which is, how do you recommend combating the misguided pro-choice movement on college campuses and especially among peers where the false narrative of the sexual revolution does run rampant? What was the last thing, the sexual revolution does what? Oh, it runs rampant. It runs rampant, great question. Thank you, thanks for your work too, it's awesome. Um, do one of you ladies want to take that first? Uh, I, I, I've, I've added my, my uh, stuff on this is basically we need to separate that sexual revolution out from the women's movement and say the sexual revolution is disempowering to women. And uh, the women's movement, as it was, was originally conceived, is empowering to women. So we, if, they, if people want, then we need to talk about sexual I, like like we've, they've just said about relationships, and and it's, it's it's not about sex is not about power. It's about love. Come on, guys, wake up. You know, <laughs> you know I don't want to underestimate the size of the wall you have to jump here, because mm -hmm. even to speak up is to be seen as you know put whatever you want in front of the word phobic. <laughs> or, or, you know, hyphen <laughs> hater, or irrational, stupid, religious bigot. You know, I could just go on insulting you and me uh, for a while. Uh, so I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, promise the moon. Um, I think, I think you have to entice with questions and personal witness. You know, I think this is why Sue's personal witness is to say, and to have even, um, you know, and it, it can't be political. It can't be associated, in my view, with a party or with, with any known side of politics. It has to be a question. It reminds me of when Ronald Reagan said something like, are you better off? You know, they say how to engage children, too. Ask them a question uh, to get them thinking. And, um, or that, that radio announcement that says, not a sermon, just a thought, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I almost think that we, we, we ask a question, we state a fact, um, you know, the, the, the facts that we have from, you know, the, the sexual research out there. I summarize it in, in part of my book, like all the inter-country studies, studies of like 160 countries, women versus men, in, in, involving tens of millions of people, and women's versus men's sexual preferences come out so clear. Mm -hmm. So you, um, you invite. If they don't come, you say, uh, you know, we invited you once. Please come. We're still inviting you. I, mm -hmm. um, you try to get equal time. I, I you know, you, equal time stuff, neutrality, <laughs> fairness. Um, as ways in, but I mean, I, my husband went to your campus. I had a friend who was in campus ministry on your campus. I'm familiar with your campus, like so many others. Um, I'm not sure none of these are surefire success, but they are fair, factual, respectful, and intelligent. Um, and I think it's a start. And, and stick with it. 
You yeah. know, I think there's a, the, the biggest enemy I think today is this enemy of, of being silenced. Um, this, you know, being called names, being called bigot, you know, phobic, whatever, and to speak up and as Helen saying, ask questions. And also I would say, talk about the positive, like what are we actually fighting for? The sexual revolution was trying to free people. To what end? To what end? To be happy? Well, if you want to be happy, then there are certain laws, <laughs> even in your own body, in your own psyche, in your own emotional state, about what you need as a human person, as a woman, as a man, like what you're made for. And talk about how do we achieve those things? Well, it's funny, when you, when you go along that conversation long enough and ask enough questions, you're going to get right back into that lifelong bond between two people who sacrifice for each other, who take responsibility for each other, who are open to life and the gift of children, and, and find that the, the, the research is on our side, that that is fulfilling, that is empowering. So we have something so good to offer. And never forget that, especially when you're being attacked by, by, a, by an opposing side that is just very hurt and wounded. But once you're willing to engage and not give up in that attempt to engage, I think we're going to see a lot more people open with, open their minds and open their hearts to this. I mean, I, I just on that question of persistence, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, when I would think nobody was listening to me for so long and I did years and years, and especially when I did pro-life exclusively. <laughs> and um, I remember uh, I did, I, I used to engage Kate Michaelman from NARAL. And um, uh, after that, I was, in, I was asked to actually do a very delicate and awful job, which was to oversee the uh, changing of the canon and civil law mm, on the question of sex abuse by clergy in Philly. And they interviewed Kate Michaelman and said, what do you think of this woman? And she's just a patsy for the church. And she said, no, she's always been honest. And she, 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 she made some points, like 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> OK, it was worth it, though. Right. OK, so I just, I, that point about mm. persistence is huge. Mm. All right, don't be afraid, as you said. Mm. Don't be afraid because we, we've got the truth on our side. Amen. Thank you. Well, Sue and Helen, thank you so very much. I think what we're going to do next, and I know Melanie will have something here too, but we're going to get some more time with our speakers. Um, there's a, a place outside to talk with them and get books and to sign, but uh, get the, your books signed. But again, this has just been such a delight. I can't thank Heritage enough and all of you for coming and Helen and Sue for your just amazing work and your life story and for sharing it with all of us. I think the, the long-term effects will be tremendous for for the pro-life cause, for the cause, for families, and for, for marriages. Thank you. Thank you so much.